Welcome back to The Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Isaac Fithian and Reap Browning of Cathedral Bitcoin to talk about underclocking Bitmain ASICs. We talk about underclocking versus overclocking, how voltage and frequency play into the terahash output of machine, and implications for bear market mining. Introducing the newest and most requested course from Foundry Academy, Intro to Hashboard Diagnosis and Repair, offered by the same experts who provided top technical training for mining technicians in the U.S. This Essential Academy course will take place in Rochester, New York from May 1st to the 5th, 2023. With a strong focus on mastering microsoldering basics, Foundry's dedicated instructors possess years of ASIC hardware experience and will guide you through each step of the process. They'll ensure that you gain the confidence and skills required to undertake basic repair jobs and keep your operation healthy and hashing. Register today at foundryacademy.com. Welcome back to the Mining Pod. I got two world-class builders with us today. It's going to be a treat episode. I have recently seen them on Marty Ben's podcast, but we got them here on the Mining Pod to go more in depth to talk about a recent report they put out about how you can underclock machines and uh, be really specific with the temperature that you're putting into a machine in order to get more Bitcoin hash rate out of it, uh, or at least make it more efficient. So Reed Browning, Isaac Fithian, welcome to the show. Thank you guys both so much for joining today. Thanks for having cool. us. <laughs> cool. So Isaac, I think I'll toss it to you first. Just lay the way in for this whole conversation, the context for what we're talking about today. Sure. So uh, Cathedra had several pre-orders of the S19J Pro Series miners, and we were looking for homes for them. Now, this is amid the context of, you know, Bitcoin's crashing a, a bit, uh, you know, hash price hash price um, prices are are deflated. And, uh, you know, we're sort of looking for homes for these pre-orders that we've got coming in. And so it's like, okay, uh, you know, we can, you know, put out a good chunk of change, uh, you know, down deposit, put in a hosting facility. We can, you know, uh, go through the capital outlay of setting up a site, uh, a site from scratch. Uh, but, you know, what, really what's the most capital efficient way of deploying these pre-ordered miners. And so we, we kind of looked at the full suite of, of infrastructure that we had access to at Cathedra and said, hey, what's the best way that we can get these deployed, uh, you know, being capital efficient, which, you know, is near and dear to every big miner's heart. You know, you're always trying to find uh, how, do, how you can do more with less, right? So we, we just, we looked and, um, you know, one of the um, sort of problems we had was we had a, a site the legacy site originally built for, uh, you know, the S9 series miners. So it's designed for miners that are much less power dense, right? So you've got lots of, uh, lots of receptacles, lots of PDUs, lots of rack space, right? But, uh, you know, not necessarily high current carrying capacity on a, you know, a per circuit basis. So it was like, well, what do you do with that? How do you get that to run? So you know, originally REIT had gone out there and was getting the first sort of tranche of pre-orders plugged in and the, the PDUs were capped. And so it's like, okay, well, if this miner is running stock 3000 watts, I, I can only put one S19 per PDU on a continuous basis, which is, you know, in terms of fully utilizing your infrastructure, pretty wasteful, right? Uh, so then we sort of got clever and said, well, hey, as long as the phases all match, we can have one and a half miners per PDU. So we would put, you know, a one miner, one PDU, and then, you know, the S19J Pro series has two C13 plugs on it. And so we would split that over two PDUs of similar phase. So it's okay, you know, 50% improvement on our utilization of infrastructure. It sure beats, you know, having a, an S19J Pro and an older model like an S9 or, uh, you know, what's minor M20S or something like that, right? Just to fill in the holes. Um, so then we we have these pre-orders coming in, and it's like, okay, what if we could just underclock these a little bit, just enough to get it so that two of them together is right below that threshold of 5,760 watts? Can we do that? Is that feasible? And we uh, tinkered around with firmware. It's like, hey, we can do that. Now we've got two miners of PDU, a little bit less hash rate. Right. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're utilizing our infrastructure and we noticed that, hey, the efficiency improved on these things. Um, you know, Brains had put out an excellent study on the effects of temperature on, on efficiency. 
and I, specifically with the you know the S um, S nineteen models, and like they're very susceptible, which makes intuitive sense, right? They're a smaller chip. They're starting to get into issues with quantum tunneling at the chip level. Um, you know, you're much more susceptible to to heat, right? So it makes sense. When, when people think about changing clocks, they automatically, oh, we're going to overclock. You know, we want to squeeze more hash rate out. Um, but there's another side to that, which is beneficial in bear markets, and that is underclocking. Because the the ultimate goal is if you increase cooling, you can increase the net efficiency because the chip at the chip level, it's more stable. Um, you can do that by, you know, immersion cooling, you know, water blocks, feeding it liquid nitrogen. But you can also do it by reducing the power that you put through each chip. And if you reduce the power going through it, you're reducing the heat density because you've reduced the power density. And that can also make the chip more efficient. So there are efficiency gains to be had by running less power through the chips, you know, within certain bounds, right? Depending on what the, uh, the chip architecture, all, all kinds of stuff. So we're just like, hey, let's look. Let's see uh, what we can get out of these things. And it's like, maybe we can get a third, you know, maybe. And then it's like, oh, we're going to try and put four. Let, let, let's see how far we can push this. And, you know, a couple of people on our team were like, Isaac, are you nuts? Uh, you know, they, me included. <laughs> so they're like, you know, you're, you're, you know, first we were having trouble getting more than one of PDU and you want to put four. And, you know, we, we just, we took a good look at it. And, uh, you know, just given today's conditions of, you know, depressed hash price, uh, you know, difficulty acquiring, uh, you know, infrastructure without, you know, heavy capital outlay and lots of pre-orders, you know, in that context, it made sense to say, hey, um, you know, it's more efficient to underclock these machines. Uh, so that that improves margins on, a, you know, the amount of revenue you've got coming in for uh, on a per kilowatt hour basis, better margins. It also allows us to get homes for all these miners. So we're, you know, we're, we're making margin on, on more machines and, uh, you know, they, you know, it's utilizing our infrastructure in a way that we couldn't have before. So it, it just, it, the stars sort of aligned with our analysis of that given infrastructure. So that's sort of the, the broad perspective. We can go into, you know, different attributes of that, uh, about why we made those key decisions, but it just seemed to all work together, uh, you know, for our context over at Cathedral. Love that. Yeah. Thanks for that background, the context there. We'll dig more into the implications in a little bit, which is definitely interesting. I love the call out there. You said like most people think of clocking and they think of overclocking and not underclocking here. And definitely important to think that there's two sides to this. Uh, I'm going to throw it up to you, Reed. Talk about the assumptions and the problems that you guys are sort of facing here on a more granular level. Uh, we had a nice overview there, the context there, but on a more granular level, what you guys were thinking about and then how you guys sort of set up the testing scenario here. Um, and for those who are listening, Below, we've included a tweet that you can follow along with this, which shows some awesome charts and images uh, that Reed and Isaac have put together for this report. You, you know, so we started out with a S19J Pro. Uh, I had a 96T. The the stuff Isaac had uh, the 100T model. We were both kind of testing things out independently. The main consideration in this was we first got some numbers we wanted to see how how low we could get our our power and you know isaac said well i can get four it's like well i think we can get three let's not get over ambitious here and so you know he went and did his thing i went to and did my thing and then we started comparing numbers and it was like okay the numbers are very, very similar. The difference between a 96T and a, um, <clears throat> a 100T at 3000 watts, okay, that's, you know, four terahashes, but at lower watts, that margin gets re a, a lot narrower. Um, there are some differences, but the, uh, it gets a lot narrower. In the winter, when we've been testing, you know, we have access to cold air, so actually creating a control environment is a whole lot easier. It, the, the, the chip temperature noted on these aftermarket firmwares are all wrong, period. Um, the S19 board has four temperature sensors, two on the front, two on the back, uh, and, you know, on each board. The We kind of use the intake 
temperature and the exhaust temperature and looked at that, the, the chip temperature is always kind of like a 15 degree Celsius delta on that. So we said, okay, it's an extrapolation. It's extrapolation. Exactly. So we took that and we said, okay, well, where, you know, where do we start seeing, you know, the benefits and in roughly between 40 and 50 degrees Celsius was kind of where we were landing. We had, you know, 30 degree air available to us. So it was like, okay, well, you know, the fans are kind of doing his thing, but then we started controlling the fans. So, you know, we were noticing that, Hey, higher temperature is less efficient. How about if we control the, the, the chip temperature and make that a static point. And so, you know, Isaac started finding pockets of where the, the most efficient points um, or where he, where it made the most sense for a four minor setup. I said, okay, well, that's great, but I don't understand what the other possibilities are. And so that's where I started going systematically, you know, volt, frequency, volt, frequency, volt, frequency, and systematically going through each combination possible. And looking at the the um, the efficiencies at each point, the watt draws, and and the terahashes uh, produced at each one of those levels. Oh, I, I just uh, just to interject quickly, I uh, just to kind of get a sense of, of how Reet and I work together. I'm probably a bit more of the cowboy between the two of us, so I'm sort of uh, the one throwing stuff at the wall to see if it sticks. And the Reet's there, be like, well. But does that violate the laws of physics? And so he, he reels me back into <laughs> Earth a little bit. So, uh, you know, basically I was like, okay, trying to fit four, take the 5,760, we're going to divide it by four, and then, okay, that's my power limit. So what can I get out of a miner? You know, what, what, so you sort of have to pick your, your North Star with these things. You say, well, what are you trying to do? Because everyone always says, oh, well, I just want better. Well, well, what does that mean? You know, if you're just constantly in the search for better, uh, you know, you it's sort of like this this void of of possibilities, right? It's hard to create a, a structure of information that that guides you, right? So you have to kind of pick. Well, what am, what are my objectives here? And we had a clear objective of it, if we can fit four miners of PDU, that would be very helpful. Um, basically, I, I I popped the bubble and said, hey, look, you know, this is possible. And then Reed said, okay, now that we know that's possible, let's explore the territory and see if we're missing uh, an optimization somewhere. So, okay, sorry, Reed, go ahead. So each, each one of those points at least was half an hour to two hours each. Um, I had to make sure that each point had the same temperature, chip temperature, each time. So if it was too hot, then had you know adjust the fans a little bit. Uh, too cold, then adjust the fans a little bit, just so that you have a levelized. You know, you're you're comparing apples to apples. I guess each point there were 218 points, two hours each. You know, do the math. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of hours. Let's take a step back for a second for those who are listening and probably don't know the relationship between frequency and voltage and hash rate and all that stuff. And Isaac, I'll throw it back to you. Can you just give us like a, a quick? 101 coursework on how uh, all those three work together here before we dive back into the temperature side of things and your guys' findings. Sure. So uh, th there's lots of different sort of, uh, you know, models you can imagine when, when you're looking at, uh, you know, how these electrical systems work, because that's what they are. They're these tiny electrical systems, very, very tiny wires in a, you know, silica substrate, right? So um, you just have to think about it in first principles. Like, okay, I want better efficiency. You know, what does that mean? It means that a job can be performed uh, using less energy, uh, you, know, on, you know, on a per per hash basis, right? Uh, using less energy. And it, it's sort of, yeah. So so first principles, what's going on? Um, I, I imagine these chips as sort of like a little city and you can change two things. You can change voltage and frequency and in sort of influence temperature, right? But, um, the, the frequency, I, I imagine it to be kind of like stoplights. So those are logic gates opening and closing. You get to decide how fast the lights change. And you can also decide the, the voltage. I compare that to sort of the, uh, the motor you put inside these little cars, right? It determines how much giddy up they've got. 
So you're sort of looking down on on this little city, and you can't you can't necessarily get a report from the electron, right? But what you get to see is okay, well, how many goods were delivered, and for what cost? And and that that's what you get out of it. You get you know what were the input costs, and what did I get out of this system? And so um, you, you can sort of think of as your your hash rate declining when you change the frequency, sort of like a crash report. Like, yep, less goods are getting delivered. This isn't working. And it's like, okay, I I need to create a very stable situation where, you know, when the traffic light goes green, the trucks can get through. And, you know, when it, you know, when they stop, you know, it stops and it's not, you know, there's not a bunch of crashes. So, you know, like, so from a electrons perspective, what is heat? And, you know, heat at um, at the quantum level, it's vibrations. You know, heat is the vibration of, of, you know, of atoms, right? From an electron's perspective, you know, if, if you're driving down the road and the road starts shaking, you know, you need a lot more energy to course correct and get to where you need to go. So as the chips get hotter, those tiny little little roads, you know, the smaller you make that road, the more you feel those shakes, right? Because it's a lot harder to stay on that, you know, it's like going on a balance beam versus an eight lane highway, right? It's getting super tiny, it's super hard to stay on course. And if the electron doesn't stay on course, then it's not going to produce work for you. And you're, we're down at a scale now where electrons can quantum tunnel through logic gates. So if you're shaking cr- rapidly, you know, you not only are you using more energy to, for those electrons to get through, but sometimes, you know, you have like invalid shares, uh, you know, like the work's not getting done properly because electrons are going where they're not supposed to when they're not supposed to, right? So... Um, you know, from the electrons perspective, if you can keep those chips cool, then the roads are more stable. They're using less power to do their work. But you also have to balance, you know, OK, you know, if I put like uh, if I put the voltage up crazy high, it's like putting, a, you know, a V12 in a little Kia, you know, that that's probably going to cause some accident. It's not going to work well because, you know, the lights go green and they're off to the race and it stops, you know, hard, hard to stop. So it's sort of like it's this thing where if you're figuring it out for the first time, you have to intuit what's happening, right? Is if, am I getting a low efficiency because, you know, the the engines are are going too fast and they're crashing the cars, or are the lights just not going at the right frequency? You know, and and you can go back and forth that. Um, so yeah, it's like to figure it out to crack the nut on it first. You sort of have to go from this first principles, like what's happening down there. You know, try and imagine it from the perspective of the electron um so i love that analogy not well not to be a stick in the mud that does break down at a certain well once you get into some of the details but from a general principle um it does work um and 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 mind you they're independent as well too so what i mean by that is that yes they do have a a relationship but the frequency is it's just a stat is saying I'm going to to turn on and off at this rate, right? I, I'm going to open up or turn my uh, light signals on and off at this this frequency. So the voltage is more like, all right, how much push should I give to make sure that I get through there with the least amount of resistance? And you know that's kind of more like a a, a timing thing. Yeah, because it's like you know, sure raise the voltage now you're you're making sure you get through the traffic light in time but you know how heavy were you stepping on the gas pedal and so if you're blowing through a bunch of fuel to be able to make it it, maybe that's not the most efficient right so you you sort of need to balance the timing you know it it, it's like uh it's like a well-tuned symphony you know everything needs to be in harmony you know the electrons go when they're supposed to the gates close when they're supposed to the electrons respect that as a barrier you know, and it's all in a, a, you know, a nice natural flow. Um, I love the back and forth here and there's like the dialogue on this because it's definitely great information. Uh, Reed, I want to throw a question back up to you and correct me as this question might be incorrect, but from my understanding in the the tweet thread, again, that I'm going to mention, you guys have these images of, I believe, the different chips and you take some measurements within the chips. Walk me through that and walk me through that relationship to what Isaac was just explaining here. Um, the key mention on on the tweets that we saw is the temperature, right? You want to control the temperature, and by doing so, you understand like where the hash rate, uh, the hash rate efficiency is going. 
what it is is like a 3D map. It's just projected on a 2D um, surface. And by keeping the temperature constant, right? So if the chip temperature is at 45, and I, I note this in the tweet where it's plus or minus two degrees, two and a half degrees. But if I keep that static, then the every combination of volts and 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 um, frequency will produce a certain efficiency because I'll have a terahash and I have the power draw. So what what Isaac is describing is there is at each frequency there is a a nominal hash rate or a hash rate that is expected to be had um, at that frequency. If I change the voltage and I go from bottom, like low to higher, the band or the most efficient band that we found was when you got to about the 99% uh, of that nominal hash rate right or expected hash rate anything above that is that yes you can push yes you will get a marginally higher um uh hash rate but it's not going to uh it, it drops off right like you you're essentially just jamming more more cars through a light that not necessarily ne not necessarily carrying any more valuable information or goods in isaac's analysis you you might get one or two terahash more. Is it worth it for the power that you're expending? Not really. It, gotcha. Just to kind of surmise that, it's like, okay, if a, a traffic light is green for a minute, how many cars could we expect to traverse through this intersection in that duration? And then it stops, and then it goes, and then it stops. Right? So you're, you can sort of calculate, hey, I can expect you know X amount of work to happen at this frequency because, you know, I would assume this, this much traffic is occurring. Uh, so that, that's the, the nominal or the expected hash rate. I'm expecting this amount of work to get done if, if everything goes perfectly. But as anyone who's been on a road knows, things don't always go perfectly. And so, um, you know, the, the voltage is, you know, if everyone is sort of on, on like, you know, Fred Flintstone, uh, you know, pedal cars, they're not necessarily going to make the stoplight. Right. And so uh, and then you get problems. Work's not getting done, uh, you know, because there's interdependency on these chips as well. So if one of them is having a hard time, the other ones will as well. So there's sort of this interdependency. Everything needs to be in harmony uh, for, you know, for, for, to produce the best work. And so what, what Reed's saying is when we adjusted the voltage so that it, it w allowed each of the electrons to make it, to the expected, uh, you know, approximately the expected rate of what the traffic lights were doing, that's where we would find the best efficiencies, which makes sense intuitively because everything's in harmony. And to that note, to that end, the the underside, so like if you look at those charts, there, there's on the bottom right-hand corner this bright yellow thing. What that was is that the power draw in that area is fairly consistent. Right, like so. If I change the 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 voltage, the power draw at the wall is is you know kind of at this diagonal um, band, f fairly consistent. What is not consistent is the hash rate. So when you look at that area, the hash rate will will ramp up, and it will just start nose diving mm. after because there's not enough juice or not enough to to maintain or not enough voltage to maintain the hash rate you know efficiency can get worse one of two ways either you're using more and more power and the hash rate isn't going up accordingly or your power usage is remaining flat but the relative work being done for the hash rate is going down so oh uh, yeah the the limits of those charts sort of you know flesh that out yeah, no, these charts are great, um, really show everything in detail. And you just brought me into a great segue there, Isaac. Let's talk about some of the implications for everything, starting with the individual units and how you guys are thinking about optimizing Cathedra's fleet. And then from there, we'll talk about implications for larger fleet management and uh, firmware options. But um, Isaac, I'll actually throw it back to you first for this question and then back up to Reed. Tell me a little bit about what the implications are for the units that you guys are now controlling at Cathedra and further deployments. 
Sure. So, uh, you know, you can go one of two ways, right? You can have, you know, uh, more hash rate and, and less efficiency, or you can, you know, with these underclocking techniques, you can increase your efficiency, but you're producing less hash rate. So, uh, so an underclock, me, the trade-off is, okay, I'm going to produce less overall revenue, but the amount I get to take home as a percentage is higher of that revenue, right? Whereas overclocking, uh, you're getting more incremental revenue, but your percentage of that revenue is is less, right? So in a in a bear market, you do not want to overclock, right? Because in a in a bear market, margins are really tight, and so if you're giving up a larger percentage of your margin, uh, then that you start to you know not be profitable anymore. And so uh, you know bear markets uh, sort of push the the standard clocks on machines into that that regime where, hey, it's not profitable anymore. And historically, what happens is you just turn it off, right? Or you sort of, you know, mine in, in a war of attrition, you know, you know, burying your teeth and staring into the void, right? And just sort of hope, hope conditions improve, right? Uh, th- those are sort of your options historically. You know, with, with these techniques, it's like, okay, well, instead of just turning stuff off or, or hoping for, for, you know, a reprieve, you could just say, all right, well, I'm going to, um, you know, re- reduce my overall income, but I still have margin. I can still run a profitable company in in a bear market. Now, and, and that makes intuitive sense, right? So just sort of, uh, you know, thinking about limits in, in calculus, you know, as Bitcoin goes towards zero, uh, you, you want to reduce your fixed costs, which is, you know, predominantly your power bill, you know, but as Bitcoin goes to infinity, you can afford to mine at almost any price, right? So, you know, if you have a, you got a 40 cent, per kilowatt hour power bill or something like that. But Bitcoin is, you know, a couple of million bucks. Like, yeah, p- plug those miners in, get the S7s rolling again. You know, it doesn't matter. You can afford to mine at any price. So it, it's just a matter of doing the analysis of, okay, what are margins uh, that I can get on a, on a per machine basis, right? That, and so it's always been, hey, what can I get for this machine? But efficiency has always been compared between models. It has not historically been compared between clocks available on a on a individual miner so i think that will create a, a much richer environment for uh you know uh optimization for being creative right um and, and just to you know expand off of that slightly uh it, it it matters uh what kind of infrastructure you have so if you're on a, a an off-grid deployment You've already paid for a generator. You've already paid for, uh, you know, a fixed amount of gas coming in, whatnot. It doesn't necessarily make sense to just have better efficiency because it's basically a, a take or pay situation where, look, I've already got a fixed cost for my generation of power. It doesn't make sense to make these run more efficiently because then I'm leaving potential generation capacity on the table. So in that context, either you would have to, you know, um, you know, bring out an additional container and more miners to fill up your generation to take advantage of that, um, you know, or potentially you have a multi-generator site and you could peel off some of those generators, redeploy them, uh, you know, you know, liquidate them or, or whatever. Um, if you're on grid and you're in a situation where um, you can afford to just say, hey, I'm going to just lower my power bill by, uh, you know, reducing my power consumption. You, you can uh, you're sort of more adaptable in a certain sense. Now there's other considerations there like like demand charges, uh, you know limits within you know uh, you know uh, thresholds and the amount of power that you're, you're required to offtake that sort of thing. Um, but but still there's a the potential to be much more flexible on an on grid situation because it's more firmware than than logistics at that point. Uh, but there's lots of considerations. I think it'll have implications for how power, uh, you know, for how PPAs are set up, for how people deploy their infrastructure, I, um, it, it'll be exciting to see how it all plays out. When you guys are doing the underclocking, how are you guys going about that with a lot of the ant miner models, at the very least being like closed box, hard to like get in there? Are you guys custom making your own firmware to underclock it or using like Vinesh or Brains and just like having... Sure, yeah. Things? We, I mean, we had, we had thought about making our own firmware, but great people working on it already. Uh, so we, we've tried, you know, we, we've tried everything. We've tried firmware yeah. from Chipless, Brains, 
yeah. uh, you know, um, ASIC.to. Uh, we, we even tried out the uh, the uh, the beta of, of you know Luxor's uh, you know new firmware. So we, we've tried a little of everything. Um, you know, yeah. at, at the end of the at the end of the day, w- once you can sort of get direct control over voltage and frequency, it mm-hmm. uh, it, it doesn't matter as much. You know, the chip's going to do what the chip's going to do. So yeah, you just need to have that fine tuned control over. The, the parameters of the chips. Um, you know, speaking broadly, um, you know, the the auto tune can be pretty helpful for squeezing the absolute most out of a a particular machine, right? Yeah. But in in that process, you sort of have to provide parameters on where you want it to look, and if you don't necessarily have an intuitive sense of where a good place to look is, you're not going to get the best out of it because you're looking in a, in a range you're sort of optimizing in the wrong mm-hmm. range right and mm-hmm. so yeah you, you sort of need both you, you need the ability to say okay in general what is a really good clock for this kind of hardware and then yeah. you can go back through and fine tune it um you know so what we were really focused on originally was okay what is a clock that works just just statically across the fleet not fine tuning chips at all at first, right? Just like what's something that in general is going to work, and then afterwards you can go back through and, and fine tune those things. Um, but it, it just depends on what you're solving for. And again, um, you know, it, yeah, it, it really depends on your infrastructure. It depends on what you're trying to do w- with the hardware. Uh, you know, also if you're participating in something like demand response, uh, you don't you don't necessarily want the absolute best clock. Because what if you're turning on and off all the time, right? You yeah. can't necessarily afford to have it sit there and auto-tune all day if you're trying to just move very quickly. Um, so sometimes, you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, depending on, on yeah. your individual circumstance. But there's, a, there's different tools for different situations. The implications are very, very big, right? Because as Isaac said, you can dynamically tune these depending on what you need. Now... You can look at the grid. It depends on where your 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 point of reference is in respect to either is it the grid, is it profitability, is it the hash price? There are a lot of inputs that you can kind of point your your North Star to and say, hey, this is what is going to make the most sense. The biggest constraint. So when we design a a containerized solution, you say how much power can I get at each end of the plug? And that is going to then size the amount of electrical that you're going to have to, to, to put into that container. And you say, okay, well that container is now 700 kilowatts, 800 kilowatts. The difference is, is that when you start underclocking, you need is say that you cut your power consumption in half. That means you need double the amount of, of, um, spaces, rack spaces, in order to consume the same amount of power. If you have existing infrastructure that you can kind of expand into and you're limited by power or the power capacity, then then you have wiggle room. And so it's looking at power capacity, power rates, uh, rack space, and all these different variables and see what you have as an asset, right? If you can take all these and, and, and categorize them, it's like, what are your goals? Are your goals max profitability, max utilization? Um, you know, if you have extra machines, great. Then, then you are now maximizing your operating profit in the best way possible. So, you know, even if you had two separate sites and with two different power rates, it doesn't mean that you should actually shove all the uh, all the machines that you possibly can into your your cheapest site. There, you know, we've been working algorithmically to say, hey, what's the best blended rate at the best um, kind of efficiency rate? And as things get better, you can also then use those those sites that are kind of we'll call it overfilled to start expanding into new places as as the hash price uh, hash price recovers and 
and so on. Gotcha. No, thank you so much for that. Any final thoughts from you guys as we close up here in a second? Just from an outsider's perspective and from looking at some recent stuff with uh, S19 XPs and talking with firmware providers, it does seem like there's a huge space for this, right? A huge space for growth here. But any final thoughts from either of you guys? I would say that the um, just go test because the whole point of doing that, that heat map and testing was to see what the possibilities were. It's clear in the, 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 the charts, for example, we can continue underclocking, but there is a, a point of, you know, it doesn't make sense to go any further because the efficiency actually gets worse. So as this whole kind of city grid light analogy comes through is that there are certain physical proclivities that the machine likes to operate at and they're different for each ma different machine. So really what we want to do or what a miner should do is saying, hey, let's go find these bands of these different machines. Let's see how they all interplay and work together. Because you know, you may not just have XPs or S19s. You might have a mixed bag and see what makes sense um, when you start testing each different machine type. Yeah, um, I, I guess, you know, one thing I would say is, uh, you know, playing these sorts of underclocking games, it's going to change the way people look at at older machines. Uh, so, you know, I, I think about the S9 where, you know, Brains came out with a great underclock firmware. You know, that's what it was. Uh, you know, it reduced the the power you're running through the machine and, and the hash rate a little bit, but you got great efficiency and they extended that, that life cycle of the S9. I think that's a trend we can sort of expect with lots of different models where, you know, once you can get in there with firmware, uh, you, you could find, you know, the, the lower bounds of what, what's truly possible efficiency wise on a machine. And you, you could see some of these older models starting to make a comeback. And so that's going to, you know, you know, uh, TikTok next block, it's going to start increasing difficulty, right? Because more people can afford to, uh, you know, subsist at, at, at lower hash prices. So I think that's sort of an interesting trend. Uh, I think it also creates an interesting dynamic when you're, uh, you're assessing, you know, machine acquisition. Like, hey, you know, what? how can I do more with less? And so, uh, you know, what if, what if we can buy a bunch of these older models that are have sort of been overlooked and, and, tossed away and we can implement some of these um, you know firmware tricks and, and and get them live again you know but then you have to also do the analysis of well if I'm using a lot less power per uh, per you know spot on the rack then I need a lot more racks to plug all of those in and then eventually I'm gonna have to you know retire those then what can I put there can I the newer models be underclocked as much it, it, it starts to get uh, pretty interesting and, and dynamic when you look at all the different ways that you can, you know, generate a, a profitable, uh, you know, Bitcoin, right? Um, you know, there's lots of ways to do it. So I think the different strategies, the different approaches different miners take, um, it's going to be vast and it's going to be really interesting to see, uh, see what miners do to be creative in the space moving forward. Love that. Yeah. Difficulty is uh, bearing down on us. We're looking at like a 12% increase pretty soon here. Um, hopefully we'll Hopefully it's not that high, but we'll see what it comes in as. But Reed, Isaac, thank you again so much for joining the Mining Pod. For those listening, where can they find either of you guys, either they're in Twitter or other places? You go. Sure, yeah, uh, on Twitter, um, I think uh, um, Isaac at Isaac Fithian and uh, at Reed B. I think it is. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, we can. I don't know if you have a, like an info place we can drop our handles if you want. But yeah, come come hit yeah. us up. We'll drop your guys' handles in the bottom. Yeah, if anyone's listening to the show and you think it's interesting or you want to integrate this into your own mining site, be sure to hit them up on Twitter. Uh, you can also look at Cathedral Bitcoin, which is a publicly listed miner in Canada. And shout out to AJ and Drew. Also, um, they join the podcast every once in a while. But we'll see you guys later. Thanks again, Isaac. Thanks, Reed. Thanks for the time.